In studio with us tonight in Los Angeles, we have Shirley Mitchell, whose credits include being Alice Darling on the old Fibber McGee and Molly program, also telephone operator Mabel on Jack Benny's radio and TV show, and uh, Shirley Whirly on Joan Davis and Rudy Valley, plus Leela Ransom, the Southern Widow, on the Great Gildersleeve. Good to have you with us, Shirley. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And also Jack Crucian, who was just who? telling me... Who? Who? I have no idea. <laughs> the man has no credentials whatsoever. Only 50 years in this business. Mm-hmm. When will you have the 50-year the mark, Jack? 50 years, September of next year. September of 88. Who has uh, covered some uh, some great ground. Uh, you, by the way, might be... And some with rotten him. ground, too. Well, all all ground is good ground if the paycheck doesn't bounce. <laughs> You're on the Webster as uh, Papadopoulos, right? Papa Papadopoulos, Yeah, right. and also you've got... Uh, uh, your work in Rags to Riches. You were nominated for Academy Award, I believe, in The Apartment. Is That's that correct? Right. That's correct. And uh, some great... Uh, well, what have I done lately? Life. You shouldn't forget, because once again, look at the pictures we drew. Just hearing voices. I could see those people. Mm-hmm. That's it. And you could hear the, the people in the background investigating the scene of the crime. It was, you know, things were done so well. And the unobtrusive sound effects and the fact that people did take time to listen to one another when they were speaking to one another. It's very unlike a lot of acting today, particularly visually. There's a feeling that people really don't listen. They just say words. And here in radio, you have to listen, you have to respond, and you have to think. You know, you hear all those sighs and you hear all that heavy breathing and it's the way people talk. It's the way we speak to one another in everyday life. And consequently, when you did that in radio, people listening would believe. Mm-hmm. The overlapping, the whole Everything. Thing. Yeah. yeah. If it was yeah. necessary, sure to overlap. Do you, absolutely. you have to be, a, do you think, a better actor or actress to do radio? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Really? Because I think everything so. was voice? Well, a lot of film actors couldn't do radio, so that indicates to you right then. I mean, they literally were not able to transpose the word into any sense. It wasn't so much that they couldn't read. I don't mean that they didn't know how to read. They knew how I to read, meant, but... I meant that reading words off of a piece of paper become traumatic for some people mm-hmm. so that they lose the trend of what they're trying to do or trying to say. Whereas... Those of us who were fortunate enough to work in the business regularly had a certain facility. We had a facility to read the words off the piece of paper, make sense out of them, as Shirley just said, Mm -hmm. and also to make them mean what the character meant so that we were able to become performers in the body of the script and in the body of the character we were playing. How else could many of us have done multiple we characters? We couldn't, you know, we, I mean, the face and the body didn't go with the voice and the character oh, that we surely. were playing. We were not, there were no boundaries to radio acting. If you had the voice and if you had the talent, let's be, oh, yes. let's be uh, yeah. honest. Well, but uh, the facility to read was part of the talent. When we were last with Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve in episode 149 of Breaking Walls, he was gearing up for his local mayoral campaign while simultaneously struggling to break away from his ex-fiancée, Leela Ransom, voiced by the just-heard Shirley Mitchell. On Easter Sunday, Gildy's mayoral campaign for Summerfield officially began, and he went to church. This episode took to the air at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time over WEAF in New York. Its rating was 17.9. Nearly 14 million people tuned in, while having Easter Sunday dinner. Kraft presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. <laughs> from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. To add to our enjoyment of the Easter season, there'll be tempting breads, muffins, hot cross buns, and rolls galore served in millions of American homes. And there'll be parquet margarine, too, adding its fine flavor to these baking treats to make them taste extra good. Fit for a feast or an everyday meal, parquet margarine is sure to win praise from your family and compliments from your guests. 
Because this craft quality spread for bread has a flavor both delicate and satisfying. Parquet has a splendid energy food, too, one of the very best you can serve. And remember, Kraft fortifies parquet margarine so that every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. That makes parquet extra nourishing, too. So be sure to always buy parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Ask for the quality margarine that's made by Kraft. Take you now to Summerfield and Summerfield's favorite son, the great Gildersleeve. Things have been going well with Gildersleeve all week. The local paper came out and gave him a nice little pat on the back, endorsing his campaign for mayor. People he doesn't know have been stopping him on the street and telling him they're for him. Even his secretary has begun to show a new respect for him. And so we find him now at dinner with his little family in a particularly jovial mood. <laughs> Yeah, come on now. Uh, Uncle Moore. Two half seconds here. Speak up, Marjorie. Oh, I couldn't. Nonsense. You don't eat enough to keep a bird alive. Does she, Bertie? That's a fact. Yeah, now here's a little piece. Oh, please. It's got your name on it. No, but I couldn't. I'm starved. Do you good, my dear. Put roses in your cheeks. Not every day you get corned beef, you know. Leroy, how about you? Yeah, Mrs. Beckham. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Take it easy, my boy. Nobody's going to take it away from you. You're not stoking a furnace, you know. Here's Leroy. <laughs> Leroy. Well, stop the big cracks when I've got my mouth full. Yes, try and find a time when it isn't. Wipe your chin, my boy. Bertie, is this all the corned beef there is? Oh, no, so go right ahead, Mr. Gillsleeve. I got some saved out in the kitchen. Well, in that case, I might just have a little piece. A little piece, he says. Huh. <laughs> oh, doorbell. Front door. See who it is, will you, Bertie? Yes, sir. I don't know who'd come here in the middle of dinner unless it's the old goat. Oh, good evening, sir. Oh, come here, Jeep. Come here, you. Hey, Jeep. Come here, boy. Leroy, I told you, no dogs during dinner. I didn't let him in. Oh, look at him beg. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Gillespie. There's a gentleman at the door. Says, could he have a word with you? Who is it, Bertie? Never mind. I'll go see him, Bertie. Uh, sit down, Leroy. I'll go. Leroy, go back and sit down. I just want to see who it is. Will you sit down? Go back and finish your dinner. Okay. Well, hello, Floyd. Come in. Mmm, I smell cabbage. Hi, Floyd. Hi, Leroy. Eat your cabbage, Leroy. Say, uh, Commissioner, this is kind of private, if you don't mind. Oh, certainly. Uh, come on in the living room. Uh, Jeeper, 7.30. The wife will kill me. Uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to say... You remember when you was in the barbershop the other day and I told you you might like to meet Clarence Magruder? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry I couldn't wait around that day. Well, what do you think? Now Magruder wants to meet you. Well, been hearing about me, has he? Of course, this is strictly on the QT, so keep it under your hat. But between you and me, I think he wants to look you over. Uh -huh. That's why he's coming here tonight. Here? Tonight? Uh -huh. He's coming here? I haven't heard anything. I know. He didn't want to take any chances. Didn't want it to get around that he's talking to you, see? <laughs> So I told him I'd be glad to do him a favor and drop by and see if he was going to be home tonight. Oh, I'll be at home, all right. Gosh, yes. Gee, if I could get Magruder behind me. You'd be in, because he really knows what's what. He knows what makes this town tick. Oh, uh, you don't have to tell me. Gee, Floyd, I really don't know how to thank you. Oh, that's all right, Commissioner. Just remember who fixed it up for you, that's all. When you get to be mayor, you know what I mean. Don't worry, Floyd. <laughs> the Gildersleeve never forgets. <laughs> <laughs> Straighten up here a little bit. Open some windows, Bertie. The place smells of cabbage. There, that's him. Leroy, come back here. Let Bertie go. Yeah, hold it a minute, Bertie. Yes, sir. Now remember what I told you, both of you. This is very important to me. I want you to keep out of the way. Can't we just peek, Uncle Moore? No, I want you to keep out of sight. But I've never even seen him. Nobody's supposed to know that he's here. Now run upstairs, both of you, quickly. All right, Bertie. Is my cap all straight? Never mind your cap. Open the door. Don't keep him waiting out there. Mr. Gildersleeve's resident. Good evening. Mr. Gildersleeve in? Whom shall I say is calling, please? Oh, Bertie, that's no way. Show him in. Yes, tell him it's a friend, if you will. Mmm, I smell cabbage. Oh, uh, Mr. McGruder? Uh, I'm Gildersleeve. Uh, come in, won't you? Come right in. Thank you. Gee, come back here, Jake. Come in, Leroy. Come on, Jake. 
Yeah, don't be frightened, Mr. Magruder. Just my nephew's puppy. Oh, not at all. I love dogs. <laughs> here, boy. Here, boy. Nice little fellow. Leroy, what did I tell you? I couldn't help it. Unky got loose. No, don't be too hard on the boy, Mr. Gildersleeve. He didn't mean any harm, I'm sure. Is this your uh, nephew? Yes, this is my nephew, Leroy. Leroy, say how do you do to Mr. Magruder. Hi. Leroy. <laughs> Fine young lad, I have a boy of my own at home, only he's about 20 years older. <laughs> and is this uh, young lady? Uh, my niece, Marjorie. Uh, what are you hanging back for, my dear? Come down and meet Mr. Magruder. <laughs> Good evening. Well, you're quite a young lady. I bet you have plenty of bows. <laughs> How about it, son? They're all over the place. <laughs> ah, charming, charming. You're a lucky man to go to sleep to have such a fine family. Yes, I'm pretty lucky at that. <laughs> now, kiddies, run along. Mr. Magruder and I have things to discuss. Bye. I'm glad to have met you. Goodbye. Oh, Sonny, come here a minute. Yeah? Ever see one of these before? Silver dollar. Here, heft it. Gosh, it's heavy. Where'd you get it? Keep it. It's yours. What? Keep it. It's a present. Yeah, it's a whole buck. Leroy, what do you say to Mr. Magruder? Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, very nice of him to give it to you. Now run along. Come on, kids. Come on, boys. Uh, shall we step into the parlor, Mr. Magruder? Ah, uh, it's a charming home you have here. Go to sleep. Charming. Oh, thank you. Sit down, Mr. Magruder. Make yourself comfortable. Oh, I can't stay. Matter of fact, I just dropped by. I've been hearing a lot about you lately, and I thought I'd sort of like to make your acquaintance. I suppose you'd like to know where I stand on a few public questions and so forth. Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. Just a little social call. Well, I'm glad you came over, because I'd like to make my position clear right at the start. Uh, your position? About what? I understand you've got a lot of influence in this town, Mr. Magruder. Well, now, you don't want to believe everything you hear, but uh, such influence as I have, I might be glad to throw behind your campaign if uh, conditions were right. Well, I want you to understand, if I'm elected mayor here, I'm going to be the mayor. I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm not going to allow myself to be dictated to by any person that, or party. That's the way I like to hear a man talk. You do? Certainly. That's the kind of a mayor this town needs. Well, in that case, I don't see why we shouldn't be able to get together. No reason at all. Now, as you may know, I have a small interest in a little construction company here in town. We have certain uh, paving contracts with the city. Mr. Magruder. Uh, just a minute now, please. These contracts are all settled. They've all been approved. They're all open and above board. Well, if they're all open and above board, I don't see that we've got anything to worry about. Well, I haven't. All I want is to be sure that some hothead doesn't get in there who's going to start rocking the boat just to make a show, you know. Now, if you can give me that assurance, I think I can practically guarantee you... Mr. Magruder, you can count on me 100%. Oh, well, now, hold on. I don't want you to think I'm rushing you into anything. Mr. Magruder, I'm a man of quick decisions. Well, now, you take a little time to think it over. Take a day. Uh, take two days. Oh, take a week. I don't need a week. Well, well, you sleep on it anyway, and then let me know how you feel, huh? It's nice to make your acquaintance, Gildersleeve. Hope we can get together on this. I'd like to see you in the mayor's office, because I don't mind telling you... I like the cut of your jib. Oh, thanks. I like the cut of yours. <laughs> Gildy. Gildy, wasn't that Clarice Magruder I just passed come up the walk? Oh, was it? What was he doing here? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, I think I have a right to know. I'm your campaign manager, aren't I? Oh, are you? You've resigned so many times, Judge, I can't remember. Oh. Gildy, can't you take a joke? Come on. What was Magruder doing here? Curiosity killed the cat, Horace. What do you want? Come on, tell. You're worse than Leroy. Is he going to back you? Is he? Possibly, if I decide to let him. If you let him? Gildersleeve, are you crazy? If you get Magruder on your side, you're in. So they tell me. Why, you're as good as mayor. This is wonderful. Well, I'm going to think it over. What for? What do you want to think for? Now, come in here and sit down. I want to talk to you. I'm sorry, Judge. I can't. I have a date. Date? I have a date with Destiny. Destiny? Yeah, and if you'll excuse me, I think I'll call her up. <laughs> yeah. Now, Gildy, listen to me. Be sensible. This is just the point where you need some good, sound advice. That's just what I'm going to get, Judge, but not from you. Good night. Gildy. Good night, Horace. Sorry, you have to run. But, Gildy, don't push me. Nighty night, Judge. Oh, good night. <laughs> now... Hello, Central. Give me heaven. La da dee da dee. Hello? Eve? Jock Morton? Yeah. I got news for you, Eve. I'll be right over. Oh, 
She's playing the piano with my picture on it. I hope she's got on that dress with a... <laughs> Hello, Throckmorton. Oh, hello, Eve. I heard you playing the piano. Yes, come in. Thank you. You know, I'm beginning to like Beethoven. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Of course, I was playing Chopin. Oh, uh, he's good, too. <laughs> Eve, will you go to church with me tomorrow, Easter? I'd love to, Throckmorton. Oh, great. You better get used to walking up and down that old church aisle with me anyway. Really? Why? Because you and I will be walking up that aisle as Mr. and Mrs. one of these days. <laughs> you seem awfully confident. I am. I'm going to be elected mayor, Eve. And you know you promised. Sit down, Jack Morton. Let's sit on the sofa. Uh, I don't dare when you're feeling so sure of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be good. Yeah, come on. All right. Now... Why are you so certain you're going to be elected all of a sudden? I just talked to Clarence Magruder, that's why. Magruder? He wants to support me for mayor. And if Magruder supports me, I'm in. Oh, Throckmorton, how could you do such a thing? How could you even talk to him? Oh, Eve, there's nothing the matter with Magruder. Well, that's ridiculous. He's a crooked politician and the whole town knows it. Well, I don't know it. He struck me as a very pleasant fellow. Throckmorton, do you expect a crooked politician to have horns and a tail? He's not crooked. Oh, don't be naive. I don't understand you. It was your idea that I should run for mayor in the first place. Now that I'm making a little progress, you don't like it. It was never my idea for you to win the election dishonestly, Throckmorton. There's nothing dishonest about it. I haven't agreed to anything. All I told you I about... don't believe I care to discuss it anymore, if you don't mind. Eve! I'm terribly disappointed in you, Throckmorton. Will you go now, please? You can't kick me out of your house. Please! I'm leaving in my own free will. <laughs> By George, young lady, you can push me just so far and no farther. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, pardon me. Forgot my hat. Goodbye. <laughs> Jack Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Today, as America stands poised for the final drive to victory, Uncle Sam expects increased effort from every one of us. Yes, the jobs ahead are going to be even tougher. And that's why wholesome, nourishing energy foods are so vitally important in your diet. Help replace some of the energy you use up every day by eating parquet margarine, the quality spread for bread that's made by Kraft. Parquet, you know, is one of the very best energy foods you can eat. And equally important, parquet margarine is a dependable source of vitamin A. Kraft fortifies parquet so that every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Parquet margarine is also so downright good tasting, your family naturally will want to eat all they need of this economical, nourishing energy food. Tomorrow, then, buy Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. Let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. It's a beautiful Easter morning, and Gildersleeve is resplendent in Easter finery for the family is about to leave for church. But our friend seems to have something troubling him. Hey, now, what do you think? A crocus came up on the front yard right exactly on Easter. Hey, crocus has been up for a month. Maybe it's a tulip. Whatever it is, it wasn't there yesterday. That's Easter for you. It has nothing to do with Leroy. What's the matter, Rob? Look at the mud on your shoes. Confounded. Five minutes ago, you looked like a gentleman. Oh, now... my gracious, he's tracked it all over the road. Yeah, take off those shoes, young man, and go out of the back porch and clean them. Oh, gosh, you don't have to get sore. What's the matter, you sick? Shoes, Leroy, now. Okay, okay. When you get them clean, sit with your hands folded until it's time to go. Oh, my goodness, I hate to let anybody in here with that mud all over. Oh, good morning, Miss Ransom. Good morning, baby. Happy the same to you. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter, Leela. Happy Easter. Yeah. Leroy, go out and clean your shoes. I'm going. Talk more. Now, I must say, you don't sound very joyous today. Easter's a time for rejoicing, you know. What do you think I should do? Skip around like a billy goat? Talk more. Aren't you feeling well? I feel fine. Why does everybody keep asking me that? Well, I don't want to bother you. I just came over to ask you a question. What? Do you think this hat is too silly for me to wear to church? I don't know anything about things like that, Leela. The hat doesn't look any sillier than... I mean, it's all right, I guess. Oh, dear, now I'm not sure. What do you think, Marjorie? Well, I think it's lovely. Oh, I'm so glad. I wouldn't want anybody to think I was being too frivolous on Easter. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I better get my hat on. We'll have to be starting in a minute. Throckmorton, 
Would you mind if I walked to church with you? Why, no. Uh, I thought you'd be going with the... What's his name? Arthur? Yes. Oh, but Arthur and I have had a misunderstanding. I thought I told you. Well, yes, you did, but I didn't know it was going to be permanent. Oh, it's not. But I would like to show him I'm not dependent on him for an escort on Easter Sunday. Do you mind? Why should I mind? As a matter of fact, even I... Uh... <clears throat> Oh, have you had a misunderstanding, too, you poor darling? <laughs> well, I suppose you'd call it that. Oh, no wonder you don't feel so eastry. Well, we'll just show them, won't we? I don't know. What can we show them? But then, but they're not the only pebbles on the beach, that's why. All right, we'll show them. Rock Martin. It's uh, quite a coincidence that we're both having misunderstandings at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, quite a coincidence. Well, we might as well make the best of it. I mean, we might as well stick together, don't you think so? Huh? Uh, what What do you mean by that, Leela? Oh, nothing in particular. No, see here, Leela. Who the dick... Excuse me. Eve! Good morning, Dr. Morton. Well, if that isn't a school teacher for you. Had you forgotten you asked me to go to church with you? Well, no, but uh, I don't know what gave me the idea you weren't coming. Well, would you rather I didn't? Oh, no. Well, I've decided I wasn't quite fair to you yesterday. You have? Ooh. Well, Eve, I'm sorry I lost my temper. Uh, aren't you going to ask me in, Ralph Morton? Oh, yes. Uh, come in. <laughs> come in and join the party. <laughs> Thank you. I thought for a moment... Oh. Good morning, Mrs. Ransom. Good morning, Miss Goodwin. Oh, well, we'll be quite a delegation going to church, won't we? <laughs> Are we all going? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Leela and Dr. Hargrave... Uh, Dr. Hargrave had to go and see a patient. Yes, a patient. So, Leela... So, when Throckmorton asked me to go to church with him, I was glad to have an escort, naturally. Naturally. Leela, it was your idea. <laughs> Rock Morton, what's the trouble? Don't you think you're a big enough man to squire two ladies in the Easter parade? Who isn't big enough? <laughs> we better get started, too. Marjorie, Leroy. I'll be right down, Mr. Moore. Are we going now, Uncle? Yes, my boy. And the shoes look fine. So try to walk carefully and keep them that way. Okay. Here's a quarter to put in the collection plate, my boy. Thanks. Oh, here's another quarter. Put that in, too. Thanks. But be very sure that I hear two clinks. <laughs> Yes, we're on time, all right. People still arriving. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Parker. Uh, same to you. Oh, I love to see you raise your hat, Frog Martin. He does it beautifully. Oh, uh, excuse me a second. I want to go over and speak to old Mrs. Carey. All right. Uh, Eve, hmm? about Leela. It wasn't my idea to take her to church, you know. She's having a little trouble with Dr. Uh, What's-his-name. I understood that perfectly, Frog Martin. You did? <laughs> you see through the darndest things. Gosh, I... Don't worry about it. Oh, it's no Mrs. Carrington, a darling. She says my hat is perfect for Easter. I was still worrying. Why worry, Leela, if we... If, what are you poking me for? There goes Arthur. He's pretending he doesn't see me, but he does. Oh, for goodness sakes, Leela. Can't you get your mind off Arthur? We're going to church. Let's go in. <laughs> before me today, my friends, as so often on Easter Sunday, many faces which do not appear here very frequently throughout the year. <laughs> so perhaps I may be forgiven if I take for my text today a thought which is not one I would ordinarily choose for an Easter sermon, but one which seems particularly appropriate in these times. Sit still, Leroy. I take my text from the second epistle of St. Peter. The second chapter, 19th verse. While they promise them liberty, they are themselves the servants of corruption. Hmm. Throckmorton. Forgot where I was. There is a thought in this text for all of us, my friends, but especially for those in high places. 
Who are they today, these servants of corruption? Who are they? I think we all know the answer. And I think we all know, too, that every servant of corruption will meet with a reckoning on Judgment Day. Judgment Day? On that final day, at the gates of eternity, there will be a reckoning. Promise one thing, my friend, and be another to be a servant of Gates of Eternity. The reckoning. Judgment Day. Say, this is quite a place. Uh, quite a place. Uh, Pardon me, are you the... Uh, Just a minute, please. I got to fill out this report. Are you in charge here? Well, I'm in charge of the gate. Something you wanted? Say, uh, don't I know you? Haven't I met you somewhere before? Not that I recall, and I have a pretty good memory. Uncanny. Well, I don't know if you're the one. I, uh, the I, uh... You wanted to get in, I suppose. They all do. If you're applying for admission, Mr. Gildersleeve, we have quite a list. Who told of... you my name? That's part of my job. Uncanny. We have quite a list of people waiting for admission, but if you'd care to leave your name. Well, I'm not ready to apply just yet. I just thought I'd kind of like to see how I stood and, you know, find out if I'm eligible. <laughs> that is, if it's not too much trouble. Oh, not at all. We have the records here. Just get my glasses on. Now, let me see. Let's see, Gildersleeve, Gildersleeve, Trump, Morton, P. That's it. What does it say? Please, I'll read it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hmm. Hmm. What does it say? Let's see. 1923, 24, a few minor peccadillos. Here, 1942, on your income tax return for that... I swear that later. Oh, yes, I see another entry here. But how about this one? What's that? April 8, 1944. That's yesterday. Uh Oh. That wouldn't be what you came to see me about, would it? I don't know what you mean. I find the name Magruder here, Clarence Magruder. Does that mean anything? Oh, about that, I'll tell you. That's okay. It's all open and above board. Is it? There seems to be something about certain city contracts. Those are okay. I understand they've all been approved. You're satisfied to let them stand? Well, it's not my responsibility. It's no business of mine. If they've been approved, they've been approved. I'm sorry to hear you say that, Mr. Gildersleeve. Why? You know why. Who approves contracts in Summerfield? The controller's office. And who is the controller? H. Prentice Magruder. Any relation to Clarence? His brother. Good day, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, wait a minute. Don't close the book. Give me a chance. I didn't promise Magruder anything. You stay there. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. And so I say unto you, let us so live our lives that on that final day of judgment we may face not only the reckoning, but ourselves. By George, I will. Throckmorton. Hush. Huh? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. George, nothing makes you feel as good as going to church. I ought to do it more often. Oh, Dr. Needham is such a fine-looking man. I thought his sermon was excellent, didn't you, Throckmorton? Yes, yes, indeed. Makes you stop and think. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Peavy, um, you here? I mean, uh, Yes? Nothing. Nothing, Peavy. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, excuse me, your wife. Oh, dear, dear. Uncanny. Uh, well, girls, let's start along, shall we? Bertie's got a fine big dinner oh, waiting. Commissioner. Gildersleeve. That barber person is calling to you, Throckmorton. Oh, uh, ladies, excuse me a moment, will you? Hi, Commissioner. Yes, Floyd, what is it? Uh, his nibs is looking for you, Magruder. He's around here somewhere. Floyd, you tell your friend Magruder. You tell him for me. Yeah? Well, you just tell him, that's all. Tell him why? Oh, oh, here he is. 
Here's your man, Mr. Magruder. I found him for you. Listen, I'm not Magruder's man or anybody else's. From now on, I'm beholden to nobody. No, no, no. Take it easy, my friend. Don't call me your friend. Not so loud. I'll talk as loud as I like. I'll talk a lot louder before I'm through. Now, Commissioner, I think that's going a little far. You keep out of this. Now, listen, Gildersleeve. When election day comes around, you know where you're going to be? Yeah, I'm going fishing with Wendell Wilkie. (laughs) (laughs) Now, get out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, we who are associated with the Worldwide Craft Organization have come to look to its founder, James L. Craft, for inspiration and friendly counsel. Today, as we pause to renew our faith, we ask you to join us in hearing his Easter message. Mr. Craft. Thank you, Mr. Perry, and warmest greetings to all of you who pause with me for these few brief moments to give solemn recognition to the Easter season. It seems most fitting in the midst of the bitterness and sorrow of total war that this Easter season be rededicated to eternal hope for man in a period of darkness, to the reaffirmation of faith in the face of a chaotic world. For the Easter season in the springtime of the year carries an ever-dying, ever-new message of the resurrection 19 centuries ago. Thus, in the quiet places of man's hearts today, There is room for joy and hope in the faith we live by. We are looking back to the quietness of that dawn of Easter Sunday, 1900 years ago, when the stone was rolled from the sepulcher and the voice of the angel came saying, He is not here, for he is risen. In the message of the Easter tide has a special meaning for all of us today, as we consecrate our lives, our purposes, and our hopes to a cause of liberty and justice for all. A cause well worth dying for, a cause surely worth living for. Let us remember that during this Easter season in many countries, spiritual faith alone is keeping alive the hopes of millions of oppressed and destitute peoples. Our posts of duty are many and varied as we look forward to the tasks which lie ahead. Millions of our young men have left their beloved homeland to fight for all that they and we hold dear. Many more, dedicated in high faith, will follow them. Standing shoulder to shoulder with them are the millions here at home, millions who now, in this sacred season, are dedicating themselves anew to the great unfinished task which lies ahead with faith in ultimate victory over the powers of oppression. Let all of us stand united with courage born of this our faith, that we may someday say, as did the disciple of old, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Thank you, Mr. Kraft. This is the National Broadcasting Company.